Hello, I'm Micah Smith from Denver 7 and welcome to Denver Decides. This community partnership is dedicated to accessible and transparent elections. The partnership includes the League of Women Voters of Denver, Interneighborhood Cooperation, and is presented by Denver 8 TV. Our mission today is to present a candidate forum in anticipation of the general election coming up on Tuesday, November 3rd. Among other offices, this election includes the candidates vying to represent constituents in Colorado State House or representatives from District 1. District 1 encompasses parts of South and Southwest Denver. Our format is pretty standard. We will begin with opening statements that will be followed by rounds of questions that have been submitted by the organizers of the forum. Since we do have a time limit, we may not be able to get to all of the submitted questions. All of the candidates will answer all questions and all of their responses will be timed. Our countdown timer is right out front for easy viewing. So let's begin by meeting the candidates vying to represent Colorado State House District 1 as your next representative. The candidates are standing left to right facing the audience in the order that they, their names will appear on the November ballot. So beginning at my right is Susan Lantine and on my left, Samantha Cook. Welcome both of you to this forum. And one more note to the candidates on behalf of our viewers, we sincerely urge you to be honest and direct forthright to help the voters distinguish one candidate from another. We will begin with one minute opening statements from each candidate. We will proceed in ballot order with these statements. So once again, starting at my right, Susan Lantine, we'll begin with your opening statement. Thank you, Micah. Good evening, Denver voters. It's been an honor to serve as a representative for House District 1 these past six years, and now I'm running for my fourth and final term. So I'm going to take this off. I've learned a lot in my service, and I'd like to take a moment to share a couple of those lessons. First, I may disagree with colleagues on the other side of the aisle on many things, but I've learned that focusing on the things we do agree on can get things done for the better. Second, that standing strong on my values doesn't mean I shouldn't listen to the other side. I've learned a lot just by listening. We are at a pivotal moment in history, and I believe the right side of history in this moment is to protect the civil rights of all Coloradans, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, or religious beliefs. I look forward to an open discussion tonight with my opponent in this race. Thank you, Denver Decides, for this opportunity. All right, thank you, Ms. Lantine. And now an opening statement from Samantha Cook. <laughs> my name is Samantha Cook, and I am truly honored to be a candidate in 2020. To say the least, this year has been challenging. We faced a pandemic, dealt with the devastation of economic shutdowns, unchecked riots, school closures, lack of safety, and unprecedented division. And the people who've been affected most are regular individuals like those of House District 1. The experiences of this year have really emphasized the importance of freedom. When we are able to make personal decisions for our well-being, we see a healthier society. When we are able to work hard and overcome challenges, we see our cities and state truly flourish. Loss of freedom means loss of hope. This has led to greater deaths from depression, suicide, and drug overdoses. As a result, where we may have saved a life from COVID, another has been lost due to shutdowns. We need to get back to the normal that allows people to thrive at their highest level and be the healthiest they can be, that of being free and allowed to prosper. Now more than ever, we need local representatives who will fight for balanced power within government, who will act through reasonable measures, and above all, put people over politics. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Now our first question for the candidates, and each candidate will have one minute to answer. We'll start in reverse order from the opening statements. So we'll begin with you, Samantha. Okay. Here's our first question. In some neighborhoods, like Marley in your district, mm -hmm. property taxes have increased as much as 25% or more. In some cases, possibly squeezing original residents out of their homes. Will the possible repeal of Gallagher lead to even more acceleration of gentrification of Denver? 
I honestly believe that it will lead to further gentrification and increased taxes. Um, you know, in looking at this particular issue, I believe that repealing the Gallagher Amendment um, will lead to less accountability to Denver voters, um, leaving one more unchecked tax hike that we have no voice in. Um, the way that we can keep our legislature accountable to the funding that they do have is to have a voice in tax e increases, um, because these are the things that directly affect Denver families, and especially in such a time as this where people are already struggling financially. Um, so I think that there are ways that we can um, produce the funding that we needed through other measures, but removing accountability where we ha no longer have a voice and one more tax measure is not the answer. All right, thank you, Samantha. Let's turn to Susan Lontine for her answer to that question. Sure, so as a member of the legislature, uh, we passed the referendum to put the repeal of the Gallagher Amendment on the ballot this year. This was a bipartisan effort from both sides of the aisle. Don't know the exact count of the vote, but it was pretty strongly held belief by Republicans and Democrats that the Gallagher Amendment should be taken out of our Constitution that, along with Tabor, has left us in a bind, especially in our small special districts. That means fire districts, hospital districts, um, a lot of areas where they have and are limited in their revenue to operate. Um, the gentrification of Denver is a struggle we are all sharing. The property tax increase in Marley is due directly to the value of the property. Um, and so I would like to make sure and assure voters that the repeal of the Gallagher Amendment will not impact the, the taxes that are collected. All right, thank you, Susan. Let's turn to you for your next answer. Uh, Susan, you'll be up first for this one. What steps, if any, should be taken to curb gun violence in our communities? This is a tough issue and largely driven by gang violence in our communities, especially in Denver. Um, I have been involved with gun safety issues at the Capitol um, and supported them. I believe we need to continue those efforts, um, especially around the issue of making sure that people who have their guns stolen, that they are reported directly to the police and we know what's out there. Um, and safe storage of weapons so that those who shouldn't have access to them um, don't have them available to them. All right, thank you. Samantha, your opportunity to answer the question. Yes, um, this is something that I struggle with as well. I have children in elementary school um, and I, as we've seen, gun violence become a more prominent issue within our schools. Um, as gun owners uh, between my family and in our home, we know that there are strong gun laws in place already. And as we've talked to various people who own these businesses, what is missing in a lot of different areas is enforcement of the laws that we already have. Um, we need to make sure that we are doing proper background checks and people, as the gun sales have gone up in this pandemic out of fear, people are realizing how strong our gun laws are. What we really need to do is start uplifting um, our school children in general. We have seen um, depression rates in Colorado go up. We need mental health resources. Um, as far as you know, gun safety, as, as important as that is, I would also like to, pref I would prefer not to see government enter our homes and tell us how to store things in, on our private property. Thank you, Samantha. And you will be the first to answer this next question. Who are the major contributors to your election campaign? Yes, um, it's honestly been a lot of community members, people that I've spoken to, um, personal donations just from friends, family, um, from different events. I've had one donation from um, my district, from the committee party. Uh, but other than that, it's been um, single donations just on an individual personal basis. Right, now Susan, your answer to that question. Thank you. I have received a variety of contributions um, as in my first election and until now in my last election. Uh, I have received contributions from uh, constituents, um, from folks around the city who don't live in House District 1, but who uh, know the work that I've done at the Capitol. I've also received donations from those who are um, different advocacy groups um, and um, including labor. Um, healthier Colorado and um, 
some other organizations like that. All right, now let's continue with our questions for our candidates vying for the State House of Representative seats from District 1. Susan, you will answer this first. What are the most pronounced similarities and differences between yourself and your opponent? I honestly can say I don't really know um, Ms. Cook very well, um, but I know she has a, a family, so I've raised two kids in Denver and actually at the home I'm living in now, so I'm sure we have some uh, common um, analogies with that. Um, you know, I, I wish I knew her better, and I don't really know. What about differences? As I can tell, we share quite a few differences, um, especially in areas of um, civil rights, um, in areas uh, regarding um, whether or not um, we do the work to increase vaccination rates with our children. Um, I um, understand she has objections to the police accountability bill that we passed um, this past legislative session. Um, there's probably a number of other issues that we disagree on, but those are the ones that I know of. All right, thank you. Samantha, your answer to that question? Yes, um, like Susan said, I know that, you know, we've both raised families in Denver. Um, you know, I think that we both support strong education for our children. Um, we might differ on ways to get there and how that's acquired, but I think that we both find that value and how important that is to all communities, of, um, regardless of ethnicity and income level. Um, I do believe that we have differences. Um, I know we have differences based on the abortion issue. Um, I would hope that we can uh, determine where we differ on civil rights, but I, I don't believe we're as far apart on that as, as we might think. Um, I believe that we both feel that there should be a certain level of police accountability. We all probably just differ on what that should look like as well. So um, those are the ones that come to mind and yeah. <laughs> okay. Now our next question from our sponsoring partners and we begin with Samantha Cook. On what topics or positions do you most and least agree with Governor Polis? I can appreciate that at least Governor Polis's attempt to keep things balanced in Colorado for a um, for the pandemic response. Um, I have tried to listen to what he's doing, and honestly, I feel for anybody that has to make decisions across the board for an entire state to try and keep people safe and healthy. Um, what I disagree with Governor Polis on is, um, ex you know, he, he's issued over 200 executive orders in this pandemic, um, and he's extended state shutdowns repeatedly, um, where we went from trying to flatten the curve, um, our curve has been flat since the end of May, and people are wondering um, when we can really look forward to getting back to what we see as normal in America and not this new normal, um, as far as you know, over-regulating businesses and keeping them closed and not allowing them to operate at full capacity. Um, I feel is doing more harm than good, just based on conversations with uh, fellow business owners in Denver. So there are a few things, but I admire him for his work. Thank you, Samantha. And Susan Lantine, your answer to that question. Uh, thank you, Micah. So I do agree with Governor Polis's measured approach on how he's handled the pandemic. Um, what Governor Polis has done is listen to science. He's listened to CDPHE, and he has done what he believes is the right thing to protect the health of our state. And that doesn't mean just our physical health, but also in the long term, it will mean coming back to our economy. Governor Polis is a businessman, he understands business, and I know that he is doing as much as he can to protect our businesses in this pandemic. I, um, I do have some differences though with Governor Polis, um, and some of it may stem from the fact that I began my uh, tenure at the legislature under Governor Hickenlooper, and um, not to compare the two um, in terms of policy, but they do have a different way of doing business and I've just got to get used to that. Now the next question for our candidates, Susan, you will begin the answer for this round. Do you believe that climate change is human created? And if so, is it a problem that requires serious public action now? And do you believe that there is a new normal in the weather? And if so, what is your plan to deal with its impact on us? So some of you may know that I grew up in Florida I left the state of Florida in 1991. 
I did not see a major hurricane from the time I was born until after I left Florida in 1992, Hurricane Andrew hit and devastated the state of Florida in the southern uh, tip. Um, now we see multiple hurricanes coming through the Gulf at once, multiple major storms uh, devastating our coasts. We have fires of unprecedented levels in California, here in Colorado, across the West. This is definitely climate change and driven by climate change. I think the best thing that we could do is try to move away as fast as we can from fossil fuels. And that doesn't mean devastating our economy because we can invest in clean energy for great jobs. And I think that is our path to trying to address it. All right, Samantha, your answer to that question. <laughs> yes, um, I, I do believe that you know, mankind, as a society, we do have an effect on, I don't know about the weather, but on our climate in general. Um, I do believe that increased activity has created to warmer climates and different changes. Um, I think that there needs to be a balanced approach to this issue because, you know, we all care about our environment. We all care about our planet. We all care about having clean air and clean water um, for ourselves now and for future generations. Um, what we need is, like I said, a balanced approach. Um, we rely a lot on fossil fuels um, in our everyday lives, in a, you know, our travel, in our homes, and our businesses. Um, and we need to make sure that in the process of trying to improve the situation that we're not um, creating damage in the wake. Um, we've also seen people being arrested for starting these fires in multiple cases um, and mismanaged forests that have not cleared dried brush that have contributed to um, the fires that have been started. So um, we, need, we need, just need to be careful where we're laying the blame and that helps us to create better solutions. Thank you, Samantha. And thank you, Susan. We're moving on <clears throat> to our next round. We call this the lightning round. Our candidates will be asked to answer questions that I read with a simple yes, no, or pass. It goes quickly. So listen closely. And remember, your answer can only be yes, no, or pass. We will go in left to right order as the candidates face the audience. And Susan, then Samantha, here's our first question. Do you support Citizens United? That state's businesses are people. No. Samantha. Mm, no. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Should all non-permitted groups be held responsible for their actions in protests? Susan. I'm not sure I understand held accountable. In what way? Responsible for damages, injuries, things like that. I'll pass. Yes. These forums will be on replay through Election Day. For future viewing audiences, we are recording this in late September. Do you think kids should be in school buildings right now? Susan. I think that should be up to the individual. Yes or no or pass? Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, pass. Yes. Okay. For this election, will you use the U.S. Postal Service to mail your ballot? No. Just drop off count? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, or pass. Okay. Um, yes, technically. <laughs> How do you plan to vote on the following ballot issues this November? Proposition 115, abortion ban after 22 weeks gestation. No. Yes. How do you plan to vote on the following ballot issues this November? Constitutional Amendment B, repealing the Gallagher Amendment. Yes. No. Should state legislators work at the Capitol longer than five or six months? No. No. Do you currently own or do you plan to own an electric car? Yes. No. House members are paid a salary of just over $40,000 per year. Was the salary and benefits what attracted you to run for office? No. No. Marijuana has been legal in Colorado for nearly eight years. Have you personally consumed some of the products available in our state? Yes. No. Does life begin at conception? No. Yes. Okay. 
Good job, candidates. Thanks for those quick answers. For the next few rounds of questioning, it's going to be the candidates' turn to ask the questions of one another. Each of you will ask your opponent a question, and hopefully they will have an answer for you. We will reverse the ballot order and begin with Samantha Cook. Samantha, you will ask Susan a question, and Susan, you will have one minute to answer. Samantha. Okay. Um, recently, a young Colorado family was unable to spend the last moments with their wife and mother as she died in the hospital alone due to COVID restrictions on the healthcare care facility. Uh, as a result, a bill was put forth to allow flexibility in these situations so that friends and loved ones are not left alone to die. The bill received bipartisan support, yet there were a few Democrats that voted against it. You were one of those that voted against this compassionate effort, and can you explain that decision? Sure. I do believe that people should have their loved ones nearby when they are sick and dying. What I was following was the guidance of our healthcare professionals and our hospitals who told us that what was in the bill wasn't feasible in managing COVID and protecting the health of patients, visitors, and providers. And so that is why I voted no. Now, Susan, it's your turn. You may ask a question of Samantha. And Samantha, as before, you will have one minute to answer. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, when you first filed to run for representative for House District 1, you listed a residence, a residential street address on your candidate affidavit. My treasurer lives close to that address and frequently takes her dog to a park there. Several weeks ago, she saw a moving van at that address and confirms to me that no one currently lives there. She also tells me that at the same time, the address on your affidavit was changed to a P.O. box with a zip code that is nowhere near House District 1. Please give the street address of your current residence so that voters are assured that you live in the district you seek to represent. Um, I do still live at that residence. We were moving out um, additional furniture. I moved the address to the P.O. box because I was receiving threats from uh, friends of our school board director. Um, so I was not feeling safe, and our Denver uh, GOP party advised me to change my address to the P.O. The PO box um, just to ensure that people weren't going to show up at my door and, and carry out some of these threats. Samantha, your turn to ask Susan another question, and Susan, you will have one minute to answer. Okay. Um, so, Ms. Lantine, um, you stated in the past that you take donations from teachers' unions, and you've been endorsed by an organization called Stand for Children Colorado, who are also strong supporters of teachers' unions. Uh, but recently, we've seen the power teachers' unions have over public education. They've primarily opposed schools reopening. They're the leading activists against school choice. Um, and as we've seen, as their power has expanded, our student outcomes in reading, math, and spelling have gone down. Um, the Colorado House Democrats website also has a statement that was in line with the union saying that the Republicans' proposal to support school vouchers was unreasonable. Um, can you explain why you'd be against any child having um, a choice in quality education and receiving the funding they need to obtain the highest possible academic success? Sure. Um I think perhaps you may understand, misunderstand the purpose of Stand for Children. Stand for Children is a advocacy group that supports school choice for kids. And I have been a proponent of school choice for kids. I even use school choice to send my own son to a high school outside of our district because I knew that the high school in our district that he was supposed to go to would not support his learning disabilities. I. Um, where I think we differ is that I will never support public funding for school vouchers to go to private schools. Let's continue with another one-on-one -on -one round. Susan, your turn to ask another question of Samantha. And Samantha, as before, you have one minute to answer. Oh. Sure. Um, do you believe that everyone, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, or religious beliefs, are deserving of equal protection under the law? Please explain. I do believe that everybody is um, entitled to equal protection under the law, and I would hope that, that that's sorry that's something that we're all fighting for. Um, what I've seen as kind of an unfortunate result is our teenage daughters and youth in school sports that are being pushed out by biological males. Um, and I, you know, this is not a discriminatory effort. It's a matter of whose rights supersede another and. Um, what are we telling that the, these girls that have worked so hard to excel in these sports and to earn these scholarships that 
it's okay for them to be completely completely <coughs> pushed out. And the only standard is that someone has to grow their hair out and say that they're a girl. If we are going to do this, then we need to have a standard across the board as to what meets that criteria to ensure that the uh, it's a level and fair game for everybody. Samantha, your turn to ask Susan a question. Susan, you'll have one minute to answer. Sure. <laughs> Um, in your last debate and throughout your time in legislature, um, you said that one of your top priorities is finding um, affordable health care. Yet this year you personally sponsored a bill that targeted cost sharing ministries, which are private organizations that assist with high costs of health care for thousands of people, which I think would align with that goal. However, through many conversations I've had with concerned community members, they're worried that the additional regulations on these ministries would severely limit their ability to benefit people and potentially drive these services out of the state. Um, so from my understanding, due to budget shortfalls, the bill was not actually passed. Um, but can you explain the reasoning behind personally targeting private assistance programs that helped people afford health care while claiming that your priority is to work toward affordable health care? Um, I would like to point out that the um, health cost sharing ministries that uh, was uh, a part of that bill are um, discriminatory in nature. Um, we have had numerous consumer complaints from um, folks who thought they had coverage for catastrophic illnesses only to discover when they went to the hospital that when a claim was presented to those um, cost-sharing organizations, their claim was denied. What the bill simply did was required transparency on their part to make sure that people knew what they were buying and to make sure that there was no um, uh, false claims um, on their behalf to say that they were in a line with Affordable Care Act uh, essential benefits because they are not. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of regulation. It was just some minimal oversight. Let's continue the one-on-one -on -one question. Susan, you may ask a question of Samantha. And Samantha, as before, you have one minute to answer. Um, Ms. Cook, what do you believe are priorities for Colorado that the legislature should address? Uh, right now, I think that we need to prioritize getting our children back to school. Um, I understand th and I agree with what Ms. Lantine said before. Well, as she started to say, I, I believe she was going to say it was a school choice or a choice between families. Um, but ultimately, we need to have these services available. It has this ripple effect where um, if children aren't in school, their parents can't go back to work. If parents are continuing to not be able to work, um, you know, the income level goes down. Um, we're seeing parents just really, really struggle with that. And we also need to prioritize making sure that we do have safety in our communities. Um, I have spoken to several law um, enforcement officers myself as a, re as a result of Senate Bill 217 who are leaving their jobs um, by their own, um, by their own they want that's what they want to do because of they don't want to risk the personal financial um, potential catastrophe that their families could face so our police are leaving and we're not and we're seeing a potential downfall in community and personal safety Samantha your turn to ask Susan another question and Susan yeah. you will have one minute to answer sure um, so we have faced the challenge of a pandemic this year. We were all able to come together, flatten the curve, and unify in the effort to not overwhelm our hospitals. However, many citizens started to question the agenda of extended shutdowns and almost 200 executive orders. And seeing people praised for protesting various social justice messages, yet criticized for protests against shutdowns. Businesses were threatened with closure while hundreds gather in the street to march and vandalize. Where the Denver School District, I believe, has still not resumed in-person learning, teachers unions can gather to protest returning to the classroom. What would you say to those who see double standards for when, how, and where people can gather to reassure them that you feel that the same standards should be applied to everybody across the board? Sure. Um, to the protest, I, those are not organized events, um, at least in any sort of organization that has any large advocacy or is uh, sponsored by the state of Colorado. Um, as to the governor's orders, he is using the best science available to keep us all safe. And I know it's hard. It's been hard on my husband's personal business. Um, we have suffered financially due to um, decreased revenue because he doesn't have um, the number of clients that he had on our radio station. So, um, you know, it, it's hard. It's hard. Um, we're going to get through this together. 
but we need to do what we can to keep the curve as flat as we can in order to not overwhelm our healthcare system. Before and until we get a vaccine, that's probably um, going to be the standard until then. And that brings us to an end of our Q&A segment, and we move now to closing statements. Each candidate will have a minute for closing statement, and we will reverse the order of the opening statements, which means we will begin with Samantha Cook. Ms. Cook, you have one minute for your closing statement. Well, I do appreciate the opportunity to come and be a part of this discussion. It's through open discussion and free speech where we can not only discuss the differences we have but find common ground and to start to heal one community at a time. In a recent hearing for a bill regarding vaccines, though thousands of parents and medical professionals showed up to speak against this bill, Ms. Lontine said she would not be held hostage by the vocal minority. However, now law-abiding citizens are being held, by, held hostage by the vocal minority on a daily basis. Vocal groups of rioters have destroyed businesses that the majority value is essential to their city. Our vocal teachers unions have kept schools closed while drowning out the many teachers who want to be in the classroom and the parents who need in-person learning for their children. Those with megaphones who are inciting violence are overpowering the voices of the majority who believe in due process and who love their fellow community members of all ethnicities. The voices of reasonable people are not being heard, and those who uphold the foundation of our economy, our education, and our safety are being silenced. As the next representative of House District 1, I will stand for safety for families, for jobs, and for getting our state back on its feet, because to me, your voice matters. And now a closing statement from Susan Lontine. Thank you, Micah. I want to close tonight by thanking Denver Decides, the Denver chapter of the League of Women Voters, Denver 8 TV, and the Inner Neighborhood um, Cooperation for their commitment to voter education on the election process and the candidates. I know that when you fill out your ballots, you are voting for candidates that share your values. I don't have a lot of time left, so I'll be succinct in summing up the values I believe in and have worked for during my tenure at the state capitol. A fair economy for everyone, black lives matter, women's rights are human rights, for that matter, health care is a human right. No human is illegal, science is real, love is love, and kindness matters. My name is Susan Lontine, and I ask for your vote. Thank you to both of you for participating in this forum. Our thanks also to the Denver Decides partners, which include Inner Neighborhood Cooperation and the League of Women Voters of Denver. Denver Decides is presented by Denver 8 TV. Remember, this election day is Tuesday, November 3rd. Make sure your voice is heard. Be sure you are registered and be sure to vote. For complete election information online, go to denverdecides.org. I'm Micah Smith from Denver 7 News. Thanks for joining us.